I'm Linda Baker, the Learning Director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. On behalf of the Learning Network team, welcome to today's resource spotlight titled, We Have the Courage to Act, a national collaboration to address and prevent gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions in Canada. I'm located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandaran peoples. These lands are connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Wherever you are located today, please take a moment and think about the traditional lands you are situated on as we acknowledge the historical and ongoing injustices that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples endure in Canada. Today, our thoughts are particularly with the people living in Peguis First Nation who've had to leave or are working to protect their homes from severe flooding. Learning Network Resource Spotlights are our way of shining a light on some of the transformative gender-based violence intervention and prevention work being undertaken in Ontario and at a national level. Today, we are delighted to welcome members of the Courage to Act team who've graciously agreed to put some of the amazing work of their multi-year national initiative into this spotlight. Their brief biographies are on the Learning Network website where you found the registration link for this event. Please join me in welcoming Farah Khan, Project Director, Brittany DeCasa, Reporting Investigations and Adjudication Working Group Co-Lead and Experiential Learning Project Lead, Deb Erkis, Reporting Investigations and Adjudication Working Group Co-Lead, and CJ Rowe, Co-Lead with the Project's Advisory Committee. Unfortunately, due to a last minute situation, Jen Flood and Adnuth Nashan are not able to join us, but we know they are an integral part of Courage to Act, and they've been an integral part of the preparation for this presentation and we're sorry they can't be with us. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Farah Khan. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be with all of you. It's so nice to see all the folks' names coming up and all the wonderful different areas that people are coming from across Canada. So again, my name is Farah Khan. I'm the executive director of Possibility Seeds, and I am the director with lots of amazing folks here today around the work around Courage to Act. And so we're going to be talking about how we kind of came together with this collaborative product project and how we want to work with all of you and kind of see how this can look together. So hopefully I can change my slides. Yeah, and so I also want to name, as we've already talked about, talking about land acknowledgement, I think any conversation about gender-based violence and consent on campuses has to start with that truth that we have seen time and time again, sexual violence, gender-based violence used as a tool to propagate colonialism. And that started from the time this country was created and continues to this day with the high rates of violence perpetuated against missing and murdered Indigenous women. And there's one quote that we really situates this conversation for us, and it's done by Do it's a part of a conversation by Dr. Sarah Hunt. And if you haven't heard her podcast interview where she talks about decolonizing rape culture, I highly recommend it. And she's a prof at the University of Victoria, and she says, as we have conversations on campus about sexual violence, we must remember that Indigenous people enter into the space, students, staff, and faculty with an existing relationship to rape culture. Sexual violence is just one manifestation of the continuum of violence wrought by settler colonialism. Indigenous women, two-spirit, trans, and queer people have been resisting colonial rape culture for years. 
mourning our loved ones whose lives have been taken in a country and with their deaths are treated as unexceptional. I think an important piece that we keep naming Encouraged to Act and the conversations that we have is that if we are not centering the voices and needs and the recommendations that have come time and time again from Indigenous communities, then we will not be accurate, accurately and really addressing sexual violence on our campus and gender-based violence on our campuses. And I highly urge you, if you haven't yet read the recommendations that come from the Truth and Reconciliation Report, as well as the recommendations that come from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Report. When I think of these conversations going forward, you know, we really thought about how do we create the conversation that feels hopeful. And so Possibility Seeds has been leading these conversations in Canada, talking about gender-based violence, talking about gender justice. And we're a leading social change consultancy dedicated to gender justice, equity, and inclusion. We have 20 years of experience working in community organizations, governments, private and public institutions. We care deeply about our work and we love working with communities. And currently we're leading Courage to Act. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the program and how this all came together and kind of the key things that we've been looking at. So Courage to Act specifically is a multi-year national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence. A lot of the, um, at post-secondary schools. And a key thing to know is that a lot of the conversations around what's happening on campuses very much focuses on just sexual violence, but for us, we wanted to look at sexual violence, domestic violence, human trafficking, forced marriage, unrelated violence, all the things that actually people experience in our schools and that we know that students are feeling. And so one of the big pieces with this is really expanding even the scope of what's happening on our campuses and the conversations that could happen. The project really builds on the Possibility Seeds report, The Courage to Act, developing a national framework to address and prevent gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions. And it's a first collaborative of its kind, bringing together 170 experts from across Canada to address gender-based violence on campus. It really is a community-driven program and project that really brought together so many amazing folks from student leaders to advocates to frontline workers to sexual assault centers, domestic violence centers. It really said, okay, what are we all looking at? What are we all seeing? How do we listen to each other in different ways? And so the first part of the conversation really for us was how can we listen to each other and how can we bring this to fruition? And CJ Rowe and I um, were part of kind of bringing this out in 2018. We met and started having these conversations with the government when they were asking us, can you do this report? And it was really kind of seeing, okay, well, what is the issue really on campus? We know what it is, both of us have having worked for a long time now in this issue, but really what are other people saying? What is the research saying? So what we know from framing the issue is that one in six men, one in three women, and one in two trans or and gender non-binary people will be subjected to some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. And that we know that 71% of students at Canadian post-secondary either witness or experience some form of unwanted sexual behaviors in a post-secondary setting, either on campus, off campus, or online. As well, 41% of reported instances of sexual assault were reported by students. So what we know is that students are disproportionately represented in survivor communities. And that's the research that we're seeing time and time again. Yet oftentimes, sometimes, oftentimes campuses are not caught up to that conversation or resources have been allocated for that community. And that's really part of what we've been talking about. Another piece to really have within this as well is that understanding that one in 10 women are subjected to sexual assault in post-secondary setting during the previous year was a research study that just came out just recently. And what they also found was 47% of Canadian post-secondary students either witness or respect to discrimination on the basis of gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation in the past year. And that's another really important part of this project. Many of our team members are queer, trans, and we really want to ensure that our communities are represented in these conversations and not a side issue, but a central one. Another piece that we really saw was that two-thirds, 62% of 2S LGBTQ people are living with disability are subjected to inappropriate sexual behavior. And that was a research report that came out in 2020. So this is something that is important to see not only as sexual violence and gender-based violence are happening to this population of students, but it's also happening to faculty and staff, 
people that have been in the school system for a long time. It also really important to understand the intersectionality with this, that it's not just thinking of students as one group and we have cookie cutter kind of services, but understanding race, gender, sexuality, our social location impacts the way in which we are targeted for sexualized violence and gender-based violence, how we are able to access services and how we're treated by mainstream institutions like the justice system, or I would say the legal system. I'm, I'm having a little bit there we go. So the first phase of the project really in 2018, 2019 was led by myself and CJ Rowe with an amazing project team of student leaders like Jay Garcia um, that really, and Sundari Melikoff, who worked with us to interview and have conversations that were both individual and focus groups around how do we look at this issue? What are the pulse that is happening on campuses around this? What are student leaders saying? What are Black students saying around this? What are Indigenous students, faculty and staff? saying what needs to be done. So we had a 29 person advisory committee that we really looked to to say, okay, is this working out? Is this not? This advisory committee was exceptional. Deb was a part of it. Brittany was a part of it. And of course we kept them on because they're so great. But it was really an amazing part where we would come with them and be like, okay, line by line, tell us what we should be including in this report, what things we need to change, what are we missing here? And we had 30 listening and learning consultations where we set up opportunities to meet individually and in groups with people to understand what was happening on campus. It was really important for us to, in the people that we talked to, to include student leaders, but also students who are survivors that may not be taking an activism role on their campus, but had experienced going through systems. It was important for us to talk to people in sexual assault centers and sexual assault domestic violence care centers to understand what they were seeing that maybe universities and colleges weren't. We also had a really good experience with reaching out to administrators, with institutional leaders to say, okay, what are the challenges you're facing? Is it funding? What is happening for you? And out of that came 45 key recommendations. It's a pretty large report, um, but it really kind of distilled for us the kind of key pieces in there. And we split up into three ways. We looked at key recommendations for education, key recommendations for support and response, and key recommendations for complaints processes. And for us, it was really important to see this as a start of a spark of a conversation and to keep the conversation going. And one of the participants said, we finally have a way to really talk about issues we're not able to approach before by broadening these, harm, these hard conversations to include people from across the spectrum, advocates, frontline workers, students, supporters, administrators, lawyers, scholars, and so many more. We've been, we've been able to learn like never before and build out what a national framework could look like. And I think that's a big piece is bringing together people who sometimes don't get to be at the same table and have those conversations and make sure that they're doing them together. And that's been key for us is how do we bring people together? How do we make sure we're listening to each other? And how do we make sure we act on these actions together? Because too often, you know, we're hearing different recommendations over and over again, but are we really kind of making sure they're speaking to one another? And I really appreciate all the introductions in the chat. It's so great to see so many people here. The next piece with it that we worked was really thinking, okay, so we've got these amazing recommendations. We're hearing from people that these need to move forward, but how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way that can really see that? And there's, there's recommendations I haven't even touched upon, things like how to work and how to ensure and affirm the voices of international students when they're facing sexual violence and gender-based violence, how to look at this from a place of adjudications with just workers, recognizing the fact that a lot of the focus and support is really about sexual harassment against students, but staff face that, employees face that, faculty face that, and how do we support them? And that's been a continuum piece. How do we make sure that everybody's involved? So phase two, um, which happened over 2019, 2020, oh my gosh, 2000, yeah, 2019, 2021, was a two year process that we did where we had kind of four key things. So we had 10 communities of practice where amazing people that some of you are on this, which is so great to see. I think Will's here from McMaster, some great folks that are just doing the work in the community. And what we found is, is that we brought together 10 of those communities of practice and what those community practice would do is they would meet on a regular basis and actually build out a key question from a recommendation that came from the report 
and build out with an with a consultant, okay, here's the tool that we need. And some amazing tools came out of it. One of the most exciting ones that we've seen so many downloads of is a non-punitive approaches to addressing sexual violence and gender-based violence on campuses. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the outcomes of those communities of practice. We also saw working groups come together. So there's three key working groups that came together, one to look at response and support, another one to look at education, and a third to look at reporting and adjudication of consent. And then the, the, the third one that we looked at was webinars, national Skillshare series, and additional tools. One of those key pieces within that for us was one of those key pieces with us was ensuring that we were able to create professional development opportunities for people in the field. Because I don't know about anybody else here, but as someone who works in the field, when I came into this job, I thought I knew what I was doing because I'd worked for so long in the gender-based violence field. I was blown away of just how many things I needed to learn and how many different approaches I had to look at. And so it was really clear for me and for our whole team is that people wanted opportunities to come together, have conversations that were really difficult. Okay, how do I do intake in a different way? Or, okay, I'm facing challenges with how to get academic considerations. What are you doing? How's that looking? What can we do differently? What are some best practices with that? And so we have a number of webinars that we did as well to kind of create that space. The fourth was really about communication outreach. We put out a lot of blog posts. We put out monthly newsletters to keep people connected because as, as we can tell, oftentimes we aren't included in the mainstream violence against women movement. Oftentimes there is the sexual assault centers and SS, SADV centers, there's violence against women shelters, um, but these centers sometimes are very isolated from those groups. And so making sure that people felt connected, people had conversations with each other. And what we heard is that people felt that. So we heard, this is a quote from Robin Ocean, who is the former um, manager of Trent University Sexual Assault Center. And they said, this work is isolating and to do this work has been so meaningful. Gender-based violence isn't a result of an individual's failing. It's a systems failure. It requires a systems response. And when the entire country gets its brightest and best people together to do the work, it may just be possible to manifest a change we have been advocating for for over a decade. So this is kind of the ways that we really saw this as a national collaboration. We ensured that there were spaces to connect a network of campus gender-based violence stakeholders. So ensuring that student leaders that were doing this work for a very long time were able to not only give advice about student pieces, but were, were on communities of practice that we're looking at international students, we're looking at how adjudication should be done. We're looking at different aspects of how reporting and investigations should be done. And it was amazing to see such a different variety. I love the fact that we had sexual assault centers really giving us feedback and being on committees to look at intake processes and how we could do that better, how we can consistently be aligned with movements that are larger than us and movements that have been doing this work for decades. Because that's the thing too, is that this work isn't new, it's just sometimes new on campuses. We also cultivated a really nourishing space for hard conversations. This is not an easy come fix it. You know, I had a little bit of arrogance when I started my job at uh, TMU. You know, when I first started, I thought, okay, I can do this. I know how to do this. But there's really difficult conversations you're dealing with. You're dealing with unions. You're dealing with different competing needs of different community members. You're dealing with oftentimes lot less budget than other folks and dealing with lots of complications. And so really creating spaces for people to feel nourished and cared for and also have those hard conversations. Also making sure that there were experts to knowledge of the issue. And so I really appreciated some of the conversations that especially your reporting investigations team were able to have about how do we approach this? How do we do it in a way that's respectful? And also how do we do it in this way that is within a framework that actually will work? Another part that we really tried to nourish was innovative practical tools, strategies, and practices. We really kept saying to each other and with the community of practice and with our every, like every kind of part of this was how does this actually implement? I don't want to just hear the word trauma informed. What does that look like on the ground? What does that feel like? What does that mean when we say that out loud? How do we talk about this from an intersectional place every time and not just from a place of nice words, but what does that actually look like? Another really big piece for us was robust piling of tools, strategies, and, and practices. So keep saying, okay, does this actually work? Will this actually work in the community? What does that look like right now if you actually implement this tool? Will it actually help you or is that actually creating more work for you? Because no one needs that. And then the last piece was really, you know, creating that strong multi-sector partnership. 
we cannot end gender-based violence on campuses if it does not end across Canada in every aspect of this country. And so that means that we need everybody on deck. We need to have those conversations. We can't just say, oh, well, we're going to deal with it in our campus and it doesn't matter what's happening in the larger community. It matters. So it matters on the budgets that sexual assault centers get. It matters what happens on the provincial and federal and territorial governments, how they deal with these issues, how they fund these issues. It impacts the students we're working with. And that's a continual thing that we say in time and time again. So right now, um, at the end of phase two, we had 27 tools available and they're available to download right now at the Courage to Act Knowledge Center. They're also available on the Possibility Seats website. And they're publicly available and free of charge to download and to implement. We encourage you to implement them. We want you to. And if you want to pilot at your institution, we've had some really great reach outs from folks being like, I'm piloting this right now. Or can you set up a time that I can meet with the authors? We're happy to do that. And our authors would be more than excited to. And that's the really great piece. It's really about ensuring that the people that are doing this work got to be heard and seen as the experts in their field, which they are. And these are just some examples of some of the amazing toolkits that came out. And I really, if, you know, the folks on the, on the line right now, the folks that were a part of our community of practice, I cannot thank you enough for the deep work that you did. You know, I thought it was so important to see things like essential elements for non-punitive accountability or things like navigating power dynamics and boundaries as a graduate student. That was another piece that really came up. Graduate students were like, okay, we gotta be included in this. We are in such a precarious place. We are both employees and also people that are facing so much as a student and there's so much tension there. There's an amazing education training toolkit that CJ is gonna to touch upon. And we also have what I really appreciate which is Courage Catalyst, creating consent culture on campus. And that is this amazing toolkit by student leaders from across the country where it profiles their stories of activism. And then it also has practical tools that they have created about how to address sexual violence on campus, how to push back, how to ask questions and how to advocate together. I highly recommend you look at it, it's something to really inspire those pieces. And so some of the ones that I just talked about, the comprehensive guide on gender-based violence complaints, there's an education and training toolkit that I know CJ is going to be talking about, supporting the whole campus. So we have this one that um, I think is really important that we need to name, which is a road map tool for working with people who have caused harm. A lot of the conversation that came up from when we do it, did our initial research report, Courage to Act in 2019, a lot of the conversation was, okay, we know somebody caused harm, but we don't know what to do. And we don't want to fall into the same kind of map that we usually fall into, which is very much about a punitive model. So what does that look like? How do we support them? And also, how do we not do things that are just like, okay, watch this webinar and you're, you're done. It's like, no, this person's part of our community. We don't want them to do it again. So what does that look like? What does support look like for them? How does we, how do we address this in a way that actually supports them? Another one that I think is really important is, of course, the essential elements for non-punitive accountability. There's a lot of conversation about alternative responses to campus gender based violence and just in general. And so we really looked at with this amazing community practice, how do we address this? So do we address it from restorative justice, transformative justice? What does that look like? What does that tangibly look like was important for us? Because again, it's easy to say, let's do this, but what does that actually look like on the ground? And that was a question we kept asking time and time again. We also really appreciated groups like QP um, that came forward and really supported us on putting together things like strategies to engage, um, sorry, strategies to look at sexual violence and gender-based violence and support people, unionized members. That was really important for us. And QP has actually come up with this great suite of tools you might want to check out about addressing this as well. And we actually had an amazing part component of our project was working with Adrienne and Adrienne has been leading the Francophone key elements in our team. And she actually worked on strategies to engage post-secondary staff in prevention and sexual violence work. And over, I think, 700 people participated in a survey about what they wanted to see around education. And that to me is a sign that people are hungry for this conversation. It's just, we have to keep it going and make it accessible for us all. Another part that we worked on was supporting international students affected by gender-based violence, recognizing that they face so many challenges with it and oftentimes are not onboarded with enough information about how to address it. And what we heard from international students we talked to with this is that oftentimes they wouldn't say the piece around being sexually harassed in school. They wouldn't say that the things were happening because they were fearful of losing their spot. They're fearful of putting down their education so they couldn't go forward. 
And yes, the cover art and the art shit list, uh, the illustrations are beautiful. Michelle Campos uh, Castillo did a lot of the Courage to Act covers. And then we worked with um, our zoo who created a lot of the illustrations, both very talented artists. Another thing that we did, I think it's really important is looking at workplace investigations. So recognizing the fact that people that are employed by the university or college can also commit sexual harassment themselves or be sexually harassed. What are best practices for that? What does that look like? And we brought together some key investigators that are doing groundbreaking work in Canada, because right now, as we know, you can, anybody can call themselves an investigator sometimes. And there's not really a standard set of who can be an investigator on these cases. And so we really wanted to say, okay, what are key principles of it? What needs to happen in these cases for it to go forward? And had some really, really important conversations with key folks around that. And there's gonna be lots more um, questions and available and tools available coming forward. So one on unions, collective agreements and institutional responses to campus sexual violence. We have a use right words guide that I'll talk about in a minute. We have a comprehensive um, guide coming out about coordinated response teams on campus and also about information sharing and another one academic considerations, which we all know is a huge issue that a lot of people face. We're working hard to ensure that again, these tools are accessible, they're tangible, and they're actually things that we can implement. So the impact has been really big for us. Um, we saw time and time again, the numbers just really tell us that this is a big issue that many people are grappling with and want support. So we had 42,500 42, visitors to our website in phase two. We had 30,000 downloads of our toolkits and articles. We had 3,500 people engaged with our professional development opportunities. We created 102 articles and thought pieces. We had over a hundred members in the 10 national communities of practice. And those are the folks that made those toolkits, which has been really important. We had 84 experts consult about our national action plan report, which is a report that led to the creation of hopefully the national action plan for Canada on addressing gender-based violence. We look specifically on what post-secondary schools could be doing and should be doing around this. We had over 65 seeking engagements across Canada, 52 media features, 45 groundbreaking tools and resources, and 36 people completed certificates. That means they came to a number of the professional development opportunities. And we did over 29 webinars and 25 newsletters. So really our goal was how do we build this as a collective voice and a conversation, knowing that there was so many of us having different ones across the country and feeling isolated, let's bring people together. Let's create opportunities for connection. And the collaboration was key. That was what we talked about a lot for this. So we said gender-based violence work is heavy and can feel isolating at times. This report and subsequent communities of practice have brought together people from different backgrounds, expertise, and social locations for all the same purpose. The important work is being done here, born out of courage to act report, not only feeds the soul for me as a participant, but also shines a huge light of hope that we have a chance to make positive difference in PSIs across Canada. So phase three is now where we're in right now. So we're in our year four and five, which has really been wild that we just started this past December. And thank, thank you to Iman, who has been uh, our amazing companion on this journey from WAGE and the Women and Gender Equality from the federal government. They've really been the, our champion with us and helped us get where we are now to continue this work. And people are saying, you know, this is, I wish all this information was built years ago. As a frontline worker, you don't always have the tools you need to support clients who experience GBV. But working on this project, developing really practical tools, policies and procedures that I can actually use in my work every day, gives me the push to keep doing what I'm doing. This is the thing, we don't have to be isolated all the time. We don't have to do this on our own. And I think that's the piece is how do we keep being connected? And knowing we don't have to reinvent the wheel, talking to other folks and being like, oh, can I see how you do your valuation? Can I talk to you about what that looks like of how the matrix that you use to do your investigations? Those things are key for this moving to go forward. So now we're doing piloting. And really that has been a part of a key thing to move forward with. So increasing awareness about the tools. So things like this has been really helpful. Improving knowledge and resources on gender-based violence by creating even more tools. And we have two evidence-based tools on sexual harassment and on community risk assessments that are coming out. We're gonna talk about a little bit and building on the capacity and the collaboration across PSIs. We can't do this in isolation. We can't do this alone. We need each other, we really do. And so that's where we see this work moving forward. And so the National Skillshare series continues with many webinars and opportunities for people to learn together. 
And I'm going to actually pass this on to my wonderful co-leads, Deb and Brittany. Thank you, Farah. Um, hello, everybody. Good to see you all here. Um, I'm uh, here on Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional gathering place for Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, and Inuit peoples, and many others. So Brittany DaCosta and I, along with Zanab Jaffrey, took advantage of the global pandemic to hunker down and write the Comprehensive Guide to Campus Gender-Based Violence Complaints. The title is not an exaggeration. The guide is so large, it had to be posted online in separate sections. So part one um, introduces fundamental standards of procedural fairness, trauma-informed practice, and harm reduction, and how they work to reinforce each other. The second section is about the structures, policies, and personnel required to provide those procedurally fair trauma-informed complaints processes to reduce harm to the participants. Because the policy is only as good as people who implement it, part three goes into the realm of practice, tracing a complaint through every step from disclosure through appeal. And finally, part four works through a number of what we've called unsettled questions. Those challenges that vex post-secondary institutions across the country, but have no clear best practices or common law to guide us. The four sections of the guide are available for download in the Courage to Act Knowledge Center. Now we know that the guide gives, uh, involves an awful lot of reading. So our goal in phase three of the project is to bring the material covered in the guide to life in other ways, including through training sessions, blog posts, roundtable discussions, and speaker series. And I'll hand it over to Brittany. Thanks, Deb. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, so the, the activities that we're offering in phase three fall under one of two umbrellas. We have the activities that are really going into what we know. What from the guide are we bringing to life that foundational knowledge that people need to know about campus gender-based violence complaints? And then what do we not know still? So those unsettled questions that we still need to grapple with. Um, the what we know activities are really about addressing the gaps in the knowledge and challenging common misconceptions that have resulted in unfair and harmful complaints processes. So um, the starting point and central thesis of our guide is these three fund fundamental standards that Deb listed, procedural fairness, trauma-informed practice, and harm reduction. Because of how foundational but misunderstood they are, our first activity, the introduction to understanding campus gender-based violence complaints, is really about defining what they mean in the context of a complaints process. How are they mutually reinforcing? And also clarifying that um, all three standards apply to all policies, procedures, and to every party. There's often a misconception that procedural fairness only applies to respondents and trauma-informed practice only applies to complainants, when in reality, they need to apply to all parties to a complaint. So we're using this session as a way to sort of dig into those standards and make sure that those are front of mind for folks moving forward. Um, we hosted our first session earlier this year, and we're gonna be offering it three more times in 2022. So. Our hope is that you'll attend or watch. Um, we do have a recording of the first session available on our website um, before the second What We Know activity, um, which, which are, is our deep dive training series. So the deep dives are where we get to look at applying the standards. This series follows a complaint from intake through to adjudication and appeal. And each session looks at a different stage in the complaint process and we go through strategies to meet the procedural fairness, trauma-informed and harm reduction standards. Um, we talk about how the strategies apply generally, um, but we also apply them to a case study that we're building on in each session. So you can really see what those look like in practice. Um, and we've designed the sessions so that you can choose, can choose whether to attend all of them and walk through a complaint right from intake through to adjudication and appeal, or attend the ones that are most relevant to you. So if you're an investigator and you wanna to stick to the investigations um, session, you, you won't be lost if you jump right in there. Um, we began the series in March. Um, so again, you can catch recordings of the sessions um, that you missed 
on our website, but we'll be running these through the spring of 2023. So there's lots of opportunities to um, attend those. I'm gonna pass it to Deb now. So the Simple Questions with Complicated Answers is a blog series. Um, as we were going through the guide, uh, reviewers across the country had a lot of questions about how things work in campus complaints. And we learned that, you know, just like gender-based violence, campus complaint processes are not clearly understood. And sometimes even those who work within them cling to assumptions that needed to be addressed. So as a result, I created a blog series and to explain how campus complaint processes generally work and how post-secondary institutions are sometimes limited in their ability to provide what students and advocates and survivors might be looking for. These posts offer foundational lessons about campus complaints in an attempt to answer questions that might be born out of frustration with the way that post-secondaries are handling gender-based violence and to dispel some common myths or mis misunderstandings. The series will continue through to the end of the project, but so far, the questions I've answered include, um, shouldn't gender-based violence complaints be left to the police? Uh, spoiler alert, the short answer is no. Um, how do campus gender-based uh, violence complaint processes work? And why won't post-secondaries proceed with an anonymous or third-party complaint? The Unsettled que um, Questions series examines what we don't know, uh, uh, more about what we don't know. So in part four of the guide, we explored three unsettled questions um, in discussion with a panel of experts. And we identified the issue, examined the legal and policy landscape, discussed the complexities of the issues, and then settled on some recommendations, either for promising practices or legislative change related to the issues. We also identified a number of other unsettled questions in the guide that still needed attention, and we'll be bringing a similar methodology to these questions. We're going to be holding um, closed roundtable discussions to work through the issues. We're going to try to come to a consensus on best or promising practices, or in the absence of clarity there, recommend some next steps. And we'll publish the results of these discussions in white papers. The two upcoming topics are, what is the PSI's role in addressing consensual personal relationships between students and faculty to prevent gender-based violence? And in the guide, we discuss privacy and confidentiality in terms of information sharing with and by the parties to a complaint. This year, we want to tackle information sharing outside of the institution, for example, to prevent those passing the harasser scenarios. Um, so our second um, sort of what we don't know um, series is our We Can Do Better speaker series. And this is going to be happening in 2023 and is a way to explore the things that we don't know, like the unsettled questions, but where there isn't a specific question that we need to answer. Um, so rather than bringing together um, a panel of experts to answer a question or come to a consensus on an issue, we really want to learn from individuals about the ongoing challenges and hurdles they're facing in their roles and some of the ways that they navigate these challenges to come up with um, some promising practices and ways to address um, these hurdles. So um, like the Unsettled Questions, we'll also be publishing these as white papers, which is really exciting. So there'll be something tangible to walk away with from these conversations. Um, and some of the topics we're going to explore in our We Can Do Better um, speaker series is how to, how to support respondents and complainants through an investigation with participation from frontline workers, survivors, and investigators, and other folks who work um, in the investigation field in different roles. So we can really see what that looks like or what it could look like. Um, the second is alternatives to the complaints process where we'll hear from practitioners who facilitate non-adjudicative options for campus survivors who want accountability without the emphasis on punishment, which um, as far as talked about is something that's really important um, throughout the project and, and came about in some other tools as well. So um, for us, this, this last session is important um, to have as that sort of like final um, takeaway because while Debs and Ab and I are really in the complaints processes world, we've done a lot of work in there. That's kind of where we live right now. Um, 
And we always want to make those processes safer and more effective and more accessible. We also um, want there to be a shift away from looking at complaints processes as the response to an incident of gender-based violence, because we recognize that even if they are fully trauma-informed, um, harm reduction principles are applied, procedural fairness is followed, they are still inherently harmful processes and they're limited in what they can achieve and are really often not what a survivor um, wants or a campus community needs. So um, this is something that we're really excited to sort of build on um, and follow our conversation up with. And I'm gonna pass it over to CJ to talk about the wonderful education work that they did. Thanks for passing it over, Brittany. Um, morning for those of you on the West Coast and afternoon to those east of wherever the time change lands. Um, joining you from the traditional unceded and stolen lands of the Squas Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth nations. Um, unfortunately not, not joined by my co-collaborator this morning, um, Jennifer Flood, but I did wanna to bring her into the room because she's taking the lead with the education and training work um, in the years four and five of the project. We also worked co-collaboratively on developing this toolkit since really the beginning, um, like many of the others already on the call and who we've heard from either were involved with the project at the beginning alongside Afar and I, or as part of the advisory committee. Um, and Jen was on the original advisory committee. Um, so what you'll find in the education and training toolbook, um, a toolkit is, really a response to the Courage to Act report that was published in 2019. We felt it was really important to honor all of the feedback, the gaps, and the, and the needs that were expressed by those who, who really helped to bring out, flush out that report and, and the key recommendations. We were really looking to provide a framework to help the work that was happening already on campuses across the country. So the tool, the tool itself um, is really meant to provide grounding for those doing this work and to build from in, in a best practices kind of way. We also note that there is a no one size fits model. So each chapter has been built with a choose your own adventure style approach. The intention here was to support educators and learning learners, and really we're all one in the same to learn and build at their own pace in a ways that makes sense given the unique context of the campus community that they're situated in. There are even tools included in the toolkit to support educators in figuring out where the gaps and opportunities are in their unique situation. One of the most significant things that we heard over and over again during the listening and learning sessions, and really over the last few years, as was echoed by those who have chatted before me, is that this work itself can be quite isolating and lonely, and we wanted to address that in some ways. So I'm going to move us to the next slide and share with you how. So after the launch of the tool toolkit, we wanted to create learning opportunities to allow folks to experiment and engage with the content. So we built out a number of exciting learning opportunities that are currently underway. These opportunities include the community of learning, which is a space for those engaged in campus anti-gender-based violence work to meet monthly to explore themes from the toolkit and to learn and grow together in co-mentorship style um, setting. We also offer learning labs, which are a series of facilitated online really hands-on learning spaces designed for campus anti-gender-based violence educators and professionals to dig deep into the concepts and worksheets from the toolkit. We have an, in fact, we actually have an upcoming learning lab on May 10th on designing guiding principles. Um, sign up, register if you're interested. Also upcoming is the All-Star Summer School. And we're really excited to offer this session. It's going to be a course in June of this year. And I'll talk a bit about uh, more in, in the next slide. We're also continuing to help build out the Knowledge Center. 
and showcase the incredible work that's happening across the country. We know this work can never be done in isolation and there are unique ways in which we can continue to address ending violence. And we can do that collaboratively by uplifting each other's work and learning and growing in ways that are generative and productive. But let me come back to the all-star summer school. So moving into the development of this course, we knew that education is key to addressing and preventing gender-based violence in post-secondary education. So this June, we are offering a free online pilot experiential learning course on creating gender-based violence education action plans. This course is open to those directly working to end campus gender-based violence. It'll be led by Jen, Flood, and Farah Khan. And this is an interactive learning experience that allows for practice on, well, it'll allow participants to practice on learning concepts from the education and training toolkit with feedback as you go along. This course will draw from case studies, the education and training toolkit, and guest speakers. By the end of the course, learners will leave with a customized action plan for their campus community. Registration for the course is open and we encourage those interested in attending and to register, register early. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to the project. We're happy to, to answer anything that may come up. Um, the other thing I wanna highlight is a lot of these learning sessions are not recorded and available publicly. And that's done thoughtfully because we really wanna create courageous spaces, spaces where educators can take risks and continue to learn and grow in really supportive environments. So if this feels right to you, please join us. I'm going to now pass it along to my colleague, Farah Khan, who will pick up the next piece. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. And you know we love CJ coming back within the fold. Um, CJ is, of course, was, was a co-director with me for the past two phases of Courage to Act. Um, and now is the chair, co-chair of the Advisory Committee for Courage to Act. We really appreciate them continuing their work with us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about support and response. I am also the co-lead on support and response, along with Amal Alini. Um, if you don't know Amal, Amal works at Carleton University, and we're so excited to have her join the team. And the support and response tools, there's going to be 14 tools that will be released in 22 and 23, in 20, 2022 and 2023. And those include things like trauma and violence informed care guidelines for medical professionals. Some of the research that we heard time and time again was when students went to medical professionals on their campus, sometimes they weren't trained in trauma informed practices, looking at intersectionality, looking at working with people um, from queer and trans communities. So we really kind of created a guide to look at this, some key things to take away around that. We also looked at academic considerations and there's a number of us that are working on that guide right now. Really, how do we do this from an, a trauma-informed place, recognizing that people are gonna come to this for different needs, but academic considerations, I think you can ask anybody who does frontline work on campuses, it's the number one thing we get asked. Another one is a, a guide to gender-based violence coordinator response teams. And this, this was something we were working on for a long time, but when things started coming out in this past September of things happening on campus and people wanting support, we really saw the urgency of it. And we actually looked at the guide and started rethinking it based on that and brought together some key folks from across the country that are working on this issue to say, okay, what does it mean when there's a major event that happens on campus? What do we need to do? Who needs to be together? What is the communication strategy? What is the best practices for, for addressing this? And I'm really excited about that tool coming out and we'll be looking for folks to um, pilot it and actually have conversations about it. So look up for that conversation. We're also doing um, a brave video, um, which is a process that I made up when I was in my early 20s, oh, actually in my teens, and started building out in my, in my 20s, that a process to look at how to take disclosures. And so we're actually creating an action toolkit on it for addressing sexual violence disclosures, and it's going to be freely available starting in September. So right ready for Consent Action Week and all the amazing things that people do. Another thing we're looking at is guidelines on confidentiality and reporting. So what are we actually doing when we have agreements between offices and departments within universities and colleges? What does it look like to support a survivor, but recognize the fact that we have the right to confidentiality? So what do support agreements look like? Also externally with other sources. 
Also, again, that's about creating information sharing agreements. And so we've been looking at that time and time again. We also have a really exciting toolkit, um, which is called User Write Words. And so that was a toolkit that I was a part of putting out in 2015. And it's a guide for reporting on sexual assault in the media. And we looked at it again because one of the things that kept coming up with the Courage Gap original report was that people were wondering, how do I have communications about this conversation? What do I do? And so we actually took the guide, we updated the sexual violence one, and then we created 15 other tools on different forms of gender-based violence for communications on each one of them, recognizing the fact that both journalists, but also communication professionals on our campuses need support on how to report on these issues, how to have conversations about these issues with language that is trauma-informed, intersectional, supportive. And lastly, we're working on this really exciting project too with an intergenerational project uh, podcast with student leaders, so high school and post-secondary um, and GBV leaders, 45 plus. I know I don't, they probably don't want me to put their age in there, but we really try to look for leaders who've been doing this work for a very long time to meet up with students who have been doing tremendous work on their campuses, both high school and university and college to say, okay, what are tactics that we've been using through decades? What are tactics that are new? What are new experiences? And what are ways that we nourish ourselves so that we continue to fight and push in a way that doesn't leave us burnt out? And so those are the kind of conversations that we're having. And I'm going to pass this on to Brittany. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to take on this one and then the next one is. Thanks, Brittany. Um, so the other part of support and response is we're actually creating a community risk assessment tool. And that was something that came up I think one of the biggest things that CJ and I heard when we were doing our interviews in the first phase of the project was, what do we do about community risk assessments? Because a lot of the times it keeps coming up about community risk assessments is that they're very much written um, from a police perspective, or they're written um, in a way that's like, okay, there's a bomb on your campus, here's the community risk assessment to there's domestic violence. And we really didn't see something that was community centered, that was looking at the literature, looking at the work, and we brought together two amazing experts, Sandy Jung um, and Jasmine Mendoza, who are both forensic um, psychologists and are looking at this issue with us. And they have this great group of expert panel that they're bringing together to create a gender-based violence risk assessment tool. And that I have to say is something that I'm so excited about because it's something that a lot of us grapple with on what to do when we have cases where we're like, okay, how do we act? What do we need to do? Or even adjudication, is it a good idea to go forward with alternative responses if there's violence is really high here? How do we assess that? What do we look at? And so this will actually give us some more guidelines on that, which I know for many of us in the movement, it's something we've been asking for. And now I'm going to pass it on to Brittany. Thanks, Fry. I think um, you did that uh, research project more justice than, than I um, could have. So thank you for for talking through that. Um, I'm also really excited about this, our second research to action project. Um, as the um, co-lead on this, or lead on this project, um, we're looking at sexual harassment in experiential learning. And this project was really important because we know that students are facing sexual harassment in their internships, co-ops, and placements, just as um, workers face um, sexual harassment in their workplaces, um, but there's so little research that really captures these experiences um, and little research to one um, acknowledge that this is a problem, a real issue, and two, that addresses the unique situation that students are in when they're in um, an experiential learning opportunity. Um, and because of the lack of research and the lack of attention on this issue, there's also very few tools and resources to help prevent and address and respond to sexual harassment when it does occur or before it occurs in these spaces. Um, so this was something that was um, identified early in the Courage to Act project as a serious gap um, and something that needed to be addressed. Um, and earlier this year, we brought together career and experiential learning staff from across the country. And what we heard from them was that this is a real issue, but that they don't have the support that they need to address it. Um, so it really confirmed that this, this project is needed. And because of the gaps in this research, we really wanted to take a comprehensive look at the issue um, at different aspects of it. Um, so we're conducting an environmental scan of the legislative and policy framework, um, as well as an environmental scan of promising practices that are out there. 
And then we're going to be doing a national survey of students, staff and faculty in fall 2022. So watch out for that if you work in um, the career and experiential learning space, if you're a student um, or a recent graduate, um, watch out for our survey that will be coming out in the fall. And this is going to help us better understand um, the issue and as well as what the needs are. Um, and then finally, we're going to be conducting some case studies um, where we're going to be interviewing students and faculty and hosting focus groups to get a more in-depth understanding of what the issue is and what the needs are that we can't capture in a broad national survey. And together, the environmental scan, the national survey and the case studies um, are going to help us identify the promising practices, develop recommendations to address gaps in legislative and policy protections, and create resources and tools for post-secondary institutions to respond to and address this issue, including resources for staff and faculty, students and employers. So hopefully this project will not only shed light on the issue that we've been hearing about, but also um, provide some tangible resources that um, staff and faculty can provide their students, can learn from themselves that post-secondary institutions can use to create um, safer and more accessible experiential learning opportunities for students. And I'm gonna pass it back over to Farah. Thank you so much, Brittany. I am so excited about that research as, as one of the people that was banging the drum, like just, just wanted work on this because so many students have come into my office and said, I guess this is just the price I pay for being in my placement or in my industry. And no student should feel that they have to be harmed to be a worker, to be in this industry of any of their choice. And so I think this research is so important for us to really push and ask for a different way forward around co-op and experiential learning. So I wanted to talk a little bit and end us off before we get into questions, a little bit about the snapshot of what's been happening for the past five, the last five months in in phase three. So we're already seeing a huge impact after we launched the tools and the end of phase two, we saw the Alberta government um, issue a directive just this year to PSIs across their province about sexual violence policies and name Courage Act as a key resource to refer to. We are seeing that we have a great partnership with the Nova Scotia um, Enigenish Women's Center and Sexual Assault Services. They're using our student organizer toolkit for their ways to change by center intervention program that's going to PSIs across Nova Scotia, which is super exciting for us because again, we want to see students' voices amplified. Many of our team were recently students or our students um, are working with students. We want students' voices there because they have been leading this work and asking for change for so long. We were really excited to hear that the Quebec government also held a consultation with Quebec PSIs about sexual violence and distributed, distributed a resource guide, which included Courage to Acts. So again, like that's another way in which we're seeing provincial governments seeing themselves as partners with this. And that's what we want to see. Our work really this the next two years is really building up those government relations. If you are um, in, a province, in a province that you want more conversation, invite us. We're happy to. We love doing presentations and having conversations with provincial partners and territorial partners. We really see this as the work we all have to do together. Another thing we really are excited to see is high school too. And I know one of the questions here was about sexual assault in high school. And we have been honored um, to partner with high school too, which we're advising the high school two movement, which are students from coast to coast that are drawing attention to the fact that sexual assault happens in high school too. And they've been doing tremendous organizing in their schools and in their provinces and territories to really name that this is a huge issue and they've been using some of the courage to act tools as a way to kind of say okay we too need a standalone policy we too need action on this and again across canada we're just seeing the toolkits piloted at universities and colleges across the country and that really excites us and if you are in a psi or a province or territory that wants to partner with us please reach out we want to it's free and it's pretty exciting to see kind of the work of your peers amplified on your own campuses and your own workplaces. I really do think that this is a movement of how we do this together. I want to thank, you know, we're going to get into the questions piece, but I, you know, I, I see people from sexual assault centers and people who've done tremendous work for decades to make this safe for us. And people also doing frontline work themselves and researchers and student leaders. This work is collaborative. This work isn't just about possibility seeds. This is about a movement that wants to end this work that didn't start with us and will not end with us. 
And I just want to thank all the people on this conversation for your work that you've been doing around addressing gender-based violence on your campus, in your community, and in your homes, because this work can only happen if we're all there. And I'm so grateful to be in community with you. So we're going to get into some, some questions. I already see some great questions in there, um, but we'll send it over to Linda to get us through this. All right. Well, the, first of all, thank you to all of the Courage Act team that presented today. And we're going to go right into questions and Jasmine and I are going to take turns asking them. And I would just ask that all of the Courage Act team uh, put their cameras on so that everybody can see you. And we're going to present questions, but we're going to let you decide who's best positioned on your team to respond. And obviously it doesn't have to just be one person. We wanted to um, start with the very first question that came in. And you had mentioned, I believe far in the introduction, you spoke of the importance of intersectional approaches and intersectional foundation to the work. And one of the questions is, what about a strong multi-sectoral approach? And I think in addition to an intersectional approach um, is maybe um, what the person is meaning and what would that look like and on the ground? And is there anyone on the team that would like to share um, a little bit about your thoughts on a strong multi-sectoral approach to the work? I can I can start us off and I you know hope folks can reach in. I think even putting together an advisory committee, we really ensured that it wasn't just the who you always see on these conversations. We reached out to people who were doing the frontline work. So ensuring that it wasn't the the head administrator at the campus, because as we know, campuses have like director and then associate director and then this and this. So we were like, okay, who's doing the actual work? Who's leading the education? Let's make sure that they're on the advisory committee. And also making sure that there were institutional leaders. Like we had Janet Morris, who's the president of Sheridan College also on it, that was exceptional. We also ensured that we had people from the Maritimes, the Atlantic provinces, making sure people from BC, also rural universities and colleges was really important to us. So having those conversations and making sure that they were part of it. I think also in terms of students, student groups that are established absolutely are part of it, but also student leaders that may not be seen as the person that's always on the TV or having the conversations being a part of this as well. And creating opportunities for students that could be pay, like paid opportunities that were like in the group and to ensure that they were part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think for me around intersectionality and CJ and I talked about this a lot was ensuring also that racialized black indigenous people were in forms of leadership making sure that people in our communities were represented that way too, making sure queer and trans folks were part of the conversation, not only to talk about queer and trans communities, but to talk about this in general. So it's not just we're pigeonholed into that, which was really important to us. So I think that's how we look at it. Multi-sector for us was part of it, but intersectionality is a key part of how we do our work and how we continue to see this work because we know that black, indigenous, racialized, queer and trans folks, people with disabilities, marginalized folks are oftentimes the most targeted for sexual violence and gender-based violence. And if their voices aren't central, then we're doing a mistake. Thank you. Did anybody else want to add to that response? I will just throw in that it is a great reminder that even as we're dealing with issues on our own campuses, it's so important to remember to get people from across the spectrum um, you know, get those voices, understand how it affects people, how people are differentially affected by certain things. And so um, this project has been a really great reminder of that. I just like to say that when you talk about that representation and the people that all have contributed and are still contributing to Courage Deck, just the comprehensiveness of your tools and the things that you've developed, it, it truly is amazing. And it, it speaks to the fact that there were a lot of people putting in ideas and, uh, and that it really is meant to support, uh, well, lots of people, but especially people doing the direct work, but also others in the community. Um, so thank you for that. Jasmine? Thanks, Linda. Uh, of course, COVID has been impacting so much of the work being done in the sector. And so this question uh, pertains to how COVID has impacted your work um, in data in terms of trends around virtual harassment, psychosocial supports required and responses for survivors. 
It definitely affected us in material ways in terms of the fact we are a national project. So I think we had, I think Deb can tell you, I think we had in phase two, we had two advisory committee meetings where we were in person. And then we had one meeting in phase two where a number of us met and then it's been virtual, which in some ways when COVID happened, we already knew how to work with each other that way. So that was okay. In terms of the data, we're not collecting data per se of sexual assault or gender-based violence on campuses. So it's not affecting us that way. We did collect data, which I think is interesting, is the impact of COVID in terms of doing the work. And we actually have a survey that came out last year and one that's coming out again, that really looks at, you know, how did people pivot? What was the impact on their work? A lot of people talked about funding being rescinded or funding shifting. People talked about more workloads because we saw intensity of gender-based violence on campuses. We saw intensity in terms of online harassment, but also violence in the home or dating in terms of more clandestine ways of dating because people didn't want to be as open about who they were with. So we also saw that impact. We have also another survey that came out about people's burnout in the movement and trauma responses. Many folks that are in frontline work left their positions or felt that they could, they didn't have a choice, that they were pushed out in some ways because they didn't have the supports they needed to do the work in a way that was trauma informed for them. I don't know, CJ, do you wanna, anything you wanna add to that piece? I think one thing that I was really proud of the project for um, is early on in the pandemic when it all hit, I think we were all really trying to figure out how to do our work respectively, not as the project, but most of us all have have and or had day jobs working in post-secondary settings, responding to survivors' needs, responding to, to reports and, and engaging in complaints processes that didn't stop when COVID started. <laughs> and so pretty quickly, the, the, the Karchak team developed some opportunities for those working within within education, prevention education, within support, within the response side of the houses, opportunities to connect and talk about some of those pinch points and really build community and build opportunities for knowledge sharing. So we had folks in the West Coast sharing ideas that folks in the East Coast were, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking literal East Coast, like Maritimes, um, we're implementing and, and vice versa. So I'm, I'm a maritimer by heart. So um, when I think East Coast, I'm like, it's not Ontario. I, I love y'all, um, <laughs> but that's a lake. Um, but watching how resources and knowledge sharing um, really happened quickly virtually in ways that supported us to continue our work. That's one of the ways that I saw COVID impact positively. So I think we often talk about the shortcomings, but I wanna talk about the benefits. And, and, and the legacy of that is carrying on. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but one of the strongest pivot points for us was moving to virtual support rooms within our daily activities. We're keeping those. Another question, is there a correlation with the underrepresentation of student victims with the often underreported or swept under the rug cases in post-secondary schools or the mismanagement of investigations into these incidents. And based on what we know, and I think that means what you know, uh, what would be the guesstimate of underreported incidents? Just a casual question, Linda, just a casual question on a, on a Tuesday. Um, so I think something to know is that we know that less than 10% of survivors report in general, right? And so what we see it and what we've seen is that the more people know campus centers exist and the process that is, the more the numbers go up. And that shouldn't be a shameful thing. Like sometimes people are nervous to say their numbers and I'm like, oh no, like I wanna know that we have bigger numbers. And even that, like I know within my own campus, the work that I do is that, I think we had like 400 people, 400 something people access services and support from us, but a very small percentage of those, like under, I think 40, went and reported, but that's because they may feel like the, the reporting isn't right for them. That's not what they need. And so I think some of the things we need to shift that question or shift the, the focus of it is always, why aren't survivors reporting? I think absolutely, we always need to ask a question, not what why survivors are reporting, but what are the conditions that make it unsafe for survivors to report? That's one. But the second one is, why do we always think that reporting is healing? 
Cause so many survivors don't want to report because that's not what their healing looks like or what justice looks like for them. What they do want to get is support for themselves. What they do want to get is therapy. And so it's interesting that when things happen on campuses, there's such a focus on pouring money into policing in terms of protecting people, which is a whole other conversation when actually supports and services need to be just like rape crisis centers. If you look at the budget between policing and sexual assault centers, very different, but more survivors will go to a sexual assault center than they'll ever report to a police. Thank you. And I will add to that, you know, when, when uh, processes are opaque, when um, it's not clear, when it, when it looks like the institution is sweeping things under the rug, I would say anecdotally, certainly people are gonna be less likely to trust their institution and come forward. And if you uh, look at that recent um, uh, news release from UBC where they changed their, their processes, they incorporated um, you know, a whole bunch of more sort of survivor focused, survivor driven responses, their numbers of reports also went up. So it's about building trust with the institution. And when the institution kind of locks down the information about how they do things, or if, they're, if their um, processes are not clearly understood, then people are going to use the reporting processes far less. It's interesting too, because it seems like different um, groups of students have more awareness or less awareness of what those procedures are. And that's a concern in itself, that awareness that you speak of, Deb. And Linda, I would add to that, what we see as Black, Indigenous, racialized students, because of the tenuous relationship they already have, and queer students, trans students, around policing authority, like in bad relationships and bad treatment, why would I report? And so it's also thinking about from an intersectional place, if we're really talking about support on campus, what does that look like for different communities? Which is really another question for those that aren't as familiar with your tools, and I know they will be after this, hopefully go and become very familiar, but are tools designed um, to be most appropriate for different groups on campus? Or, have you informed all that you learned from different groups that you worked with into one tool, for instance? I'm gonna kind of jump jump in there, Linda, um, because I mean I think it's that's a I don't think there's one way that we went about developing tools. In fact, I, I'm I'm hung up on a on a strengths based model this morning, but I do think one of the one of the strengths of our approach is that we had real expertise working on one of three buckets of, of, of information, as well as um, 10 communities of practice that brought their own skills and expertise to developing tools that resonated for their experience, for their expertise. Um, so there is, I would say there's no one formula that helped inform the creation of, of any one of the tools, and they were all developed with strengths-based, looking at who's doing it well, where are their learning edges? How do we support people to adopt them so that these tools can be used in ways that can respond to the very unique and diverse needs within those campus communities? Because the campus community makeup where, where I work um, is very different than where Deb is. And again, different than the community that far is supporting and responding to. And so in de developing those tools, we realized that there is no one size fit all model, but what can we create? What sort of frameworks and rubrics that people could kind of come in, we could support them to adopt and build out in term, in ways that would meet the very unique needs of their campus communities. And I would say that's what, we, that's from my perspective, one of the things we were really striving for. And this was one of the major benefits of the way we had communities across the, the country sort of reviewing our work because they would call us to account. You know, if we were presenting something from only a single viewpoint, we would have people going, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? So it's kind of a, you know, a both end, you know, if, if for example, we have a tool for graduate students, but it also is it very intersectional because we have to make sure that we're representing and, and you know, um, considering all of these different viewpoints in all of the tools. Thank you. Jasmine? 
Yes, thank you. One individual has asked, I'm curious about your use of terminology, since at times you're using gender-based violence and at times sexual violence, assault, or harassment. Can you speak more to the value of the different terms for the various parts of this work and the process for choosing to use one instead of the other? We use them sometimes interchangeably even. So I think that's something that we really saw. I think for some folks, gender-based violence doesn't speak to their experience and doesn't work for them. And sexual violence is something that a lot of the movement about campus work has been on about sexual violence. So sometimes using that is a political choice to get people on side. So you're working on sexual violence, so are we. This is the work that we're doing. And some of the tools, like the, the BRAVE model is focusing on sexual violence, but it can be used for gender-based violence. And I think also harassment, sometimes, not sometimes, when, when we talk to students, and especially when we're talking to survivors, they would say, well, it doesn't fit into sexual violence what happened to me, but it was sexual harassment. And so using language that meets the needs of survivors that speaks to what is experienced by them and also to not say that sexual harassment isn't as bad like oftentimes there's this idea like this is the bad sexual violence and everything else is kind of okay and sexual harassment as i often say it becomes the wallpaper of a lot of people's lives that it's just something we should be used to and so we use those interchangeably sometimes to denote what people are experiencing and what they see, and also to make sure that people understand that we're doing it from a whole constellation of this. To me, like I would be talking about forced marriage or other forms of violence as well um, in the work that I do. I think it really also matters on your campus and what campus communities are experiencing as well. I see heads nodding, but nobody's um, jumping in. So I'm going to uh, go to another question. In the previous question, you mentioned, uh, Farah, in particular, you talked about the difference in funding, for instance, between um, um, security, policing, and, and some of the support services. And one of the questions is often on campus, um, often campus security teams are the only university officials who are on campus weekends and evenings. We know we are not the best reporting group, but people report there regardless. How can we include them? I think that means campus security teams to help create a safe space. We had people from security on our communities of practice to, and had conversations. I'm thinking of Emory, um, some other folks that we had. And, and I'm going to answer this quickly and then I'll pass it on to my team, but I think it's imperative if those are the people that are on campus at four in the morning supporting a survivor, then they need to be a part of it. I think there's a lot of challenges with it too, that a lot of times that people are doing the night shift at a lot of campuses are oftentimes not like a full-time staff of the university or college. They are oftentimes coming from like a a security company. So it's like, how are they trained? How are they ongoing trained? Are they working in tandem with the sexual assault center? How are they working in tandem? What does communication look like? Where are they sending folks? How are they sending the folks if they have been sexually assaulted? Because the thing is those 4 a.m. calls, I get them and they're horrific what sometimes you get those calls about. And we need to be in tandem because it's also how do we work together? I think another thing that doesn't be brought up enough about folks in those roles is they also need places to debrief and attend to the trauma that they witness. And sometimes that is not talked about enough around harm of first responders and the need to address trauma exposure. I'll jump in too and say that um, it's really important for security folks to feel like they're part of the post-secondary environment culture, um, you know, world, because they come from a policey type background. And so if they're bringing in police uh, processes, police training, um, they may not feel like part of the campus culture and they may not be as uh, uh, safe feeling for someone to come forward to. So in, in addition to training, we also want to bring them into those discussions about sexual and gender-based violence to make sure that they understand the, you know, the, the post-secondary educational administrative approach versus the police approach. Thanks, Deb. Jasmine? One question that's come in is, one tension and consistent question I receive is around using survivor-centered approaches in the case of investigations. 
where institutions may need to move forward even where survivors may not want to participate. Is there a resource that speaks specifically to this? We do address it in the guide. It's not, you know, it's it's not a huge part of it, but it, we always have to acknowledge that there will be times that an institution for various reasons is required maybe by, by regulations or law to um, address an issue, even if the survivor doesn't want to be a complainant. So there are various different ways to do that. And, and what we have to remember is that even if we're proceeding with a complaint and the survivor doesn't want to, we have to remember there was a survivor involved there and we cannot cut them out entirely. We must make sure that they're supported and make sure that they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're using their information, how we're protecting their, their privacy, all of those different things so that um, we're not forcing them into a situation where either we're exposing them or they're forced to expose themselves or, or make themselves vulnerable to you know, harmful processes. So um, it, is, uh, it, it is a part of being in, on a campus is that there are gonna be times where we do have to deal with an issue. Um, we may not deal with it as a complaint, as a, as a, a way to you know, figure out who committed some sort of offense and punish them. We might deal with it as an occupational health and safety issue where we look at the environment in which it was allowed to happen and change the environment. So there's lots of different approaches. And as, uh, as campus communities, we also have to remember that it's not always about identifying the bad person and punishing them. That is a very, very limited approach. And it, it ties our hands, quite frankly, when there are many, many other things we could be doing to make sure that our learning environment is safe. Another question um, that has come in is really about opportunities for people who want to support your work. And they may want to support your work as survivors of uh, workplace gender-based violence. It may be that it's campus. Um, gender-based violence was the experience. But is there a way for others to get involved? And would you speak to that for a little bit? Yeah, there's lots of ways. I, I really encourage people to sign up to our monthly newsletter, which always has opportunities for people to partner, to people to join conversations that are closed door. As I love that CJ named that because that's been a really important thing for us to have curated, courageous conversations that feel safer. I think another thing is if you're from a sexual assault center, because I saw that question as well, sexual assault centers, domestic violence care centers, the feminist movement is key to this. And any partnership that we can have with those movements is really important to us because you've been doing this work for so long and also survivors come to you more than they'll come to campus centers. And so if we're not working in tandem, one of the things that was really interesting when we had some sexual assault centers come into the advisory committee was hearing from them even, oh, I can send students to their campus and they can get funding for safe house. They can get money to finish their school, they can get help with academics and I can do the counseling and support, but you can do all this piece is wonderful. So it's how we can also work better together, I think is another piece that we're naming. But I think again, you know, we really do need the community to be a part of this. So please sign up for the newsletter. That's really the best place to kind of know what opportunities are coming up. Are you, when you say we, I, I know you're using a large we, but you're speaking also from courage to act. And I think from your presentation, the team's presentation, it's really clear that you value community and know that it takes everybody um, to do this work and to make progress with this work and support at, um, those that are experiencing and have experienced um, sexual violence. I guess one of the questions was really more at you're open to that and you see that as it's very important. Do you find that campuses, institutions are open to that and see the value of the community or, or is there in some cases or too many cases that sort of concern about having somebody from the outside coming in or maybe doing things that aren't in tandem with what they want, et cetera. I think there can be, absolutely. And there's no question, right? And I think because there's this, I, even when I came in as someone, I was an outsider to academia, I had never worked in university or college before coming in and people were like, well, who are you to ask this question or 
what are you doing here kind of thing or we have a way of doing this or we don't have a way of doing this and we don't need to have a way of doing this so i think sometimes you will be seen as a troublemaker when you're asking these questions and that's why having a network is really important i think that's a big piece i think institutions need to be more open to partnerships with local organizations that are actually set in stone so actually like okay we're gonna have a collaborative agreement so that i know if I'm sending students to you, they know about our services, they know about yours. I think there's been some amazing ones. We profiled them uh, like a year ago, we profiled all these amazing schools that actually have a part of their levy that is sent to the local sexual assault center. So Trent gives part of their funds to the local sexual assault center every year. That to me is groundbreaking work and recognizes the work that the sexual assault center does daily to support survivors. So things like that, we need to champion and do more of because these sexual assault centers consistently are doing that work and they need to be championed in that. But I, I do think like the partnerships are so important because again, survivors also may want to say something that they're not ready to say to a sexual assault center on campus. So if they're being sexually assaulted by a faculty member or an employee and they're not ready to tell the university because if they do tell an office like ours, an office at a center that we we do have to act. So if they need to tell somebody that feels safer or a different way, that's an opportunity to do that. So I think those kind of partnerships are really amazing. Another partnership I'll just say, the last one is counselors. So some universities have a partnership with a local sexual assault center or feminist organization to provide counseling that way. And I know Laurie has that, and that's a really great opportunity to do that kind of partnership piece. It's also really great to um, uh, do that when internally you just don't have the resources to meet this insane need i mean it is a huge huge need it's it's you know endless and we have very finite resources so what better way than to partner with those in our community and particularly for small institutions that just don't that they have one person doing all of this work they need support they need to partner with other people I think, I think the other piece too, I want to slip this in, is, um, is, is networks. It's really important for folks who are doing this work in, in post-secondary settings to be part of community-based networks, um, to provide support to survivors, and also to provide educational support and engage in community initiatives and, and support communities. Um, I think one of the benefits to us move doing more and more things like this virtually is we've been able to collaborate with more community-based centers across the province and, and collaboratively come together for an event on, on Zoom. It cost, a cut, has cut all of our costs. Um, and as much as I miss seeing people in person, um, I get to see people more often because we're in these virtual spaces. So the strength too in, in, in those collaborations are ongoing learning and, and ways to uphold and push forward educational initiatives. I would add one last piece is that if you're part of a sexual assault center, or domestic violence care center, invite your local, invite the local sexual assault center in the university or college to one of your meetings, because oftentimes that person is very isolated. You've already had established network and those people are real workers in the field and sometimes feel really isolated because they're not part of the traditional networks. And that's what we hear time and time again. And that's a really important also thing that sexual assault centers and domestic violence care centers can do and feminist organizations can do. Thank you so much. There are more questions, but I'm afraid we have run out of time and we have learned from participants in our resource spotlights that they really value it when we honor the time commitment that we made. So I want to take this moment on behalf of Jasmine and myself to thank CJ Rowe, to thank Deb Erkis, Brittany DaCosta, Farah Khan for joining us and of course, Anuth and Jen, who weren't able to be here. I think that, I know I'm gonna speak for myself, but I thought I knew a fair bit about courage to act. And I think that sometimes, you know, we receive a report and it's exciting and then we make sure that we promote that. But I had no idea of the depth of the work and the, the comprehensiveness of it across so many uh, different areas. And I don't think probably I'm the only one uh, that didn't um, realize that. So it's so wonderful that you were all here today and that the Learning Network could do our small piece in helping to make people that may not have been as familiar with Courage to Act more aware of it. 
We are also grateful to Dean Weeb and Ruk Benjamin from Toronto Interpreter Sign Language for being with us throughout the whole hour and a half. We always value so much um, what you do on behalf of our community. And I also want to remind people that the recording for this resource spotlight, as well as the PowerPoint slides, um, thanks to the generosity of our presenters, as well as the list of resources, all of those amazing resources that they referenced during the presentation. Those will be also side by side with the recording and that people um, can access those. And that will be available in, um, within a couple of weeks on the Learning Network um, website. So again, thank you to Courage to Act and everybody who participated. And we know that you um, are so good about filling out the evaluation and you're, when we close the spotlight, it will open into your browser and then you'll get your certificate of attendance. So on that note, I'm going to wish everybody uh, a safe, um, I guess <laughs> you don't have to journey home. Uh, hopefully you're, you're at home, but if you are a safe journey home at the end of this day, and we'll see you next time. Bye.